Cue, Love Sick, Bob Dylan, track one, Time Out of Mind. I'm walking. Yeah, that's good. Through streets that are dead. That's real good. <clears throat> we open tight on a man. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me rephrase. We open on our hero. We push in on his face. Motherfucker, I said push in on that shit. Mid-twenties, handsome, gay, gay in that cool cat kind of way. Gay like Billy on the street, gay. Gay like, it's who I am. It's not all I am, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's one cool cat we got over here. But right now, this cat's anything but cool. This cat's in crisis. I feel ashamed, I guess. I know this doesn't make me look very good, but it's uh, breaking me and... Um... Let it go, brother. Let it go like a proud asshole. Let it go, let it go. I just... He and I have been together for so long. I know it sounds cliche, but I guess... I like knowing he's on my team, you know? I know, my brother. I hear you, my brother. Let it go. When this new guy has come along... Mm -hmm. Proceed. And he's new. He's exciting, and he's so much younger. Oh, ain't no shame, brother. I, know I can't stick with someone without loyalty. And you know this. OK, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put Sterling Shepard in my flex wide receiver spot and drop Larry Fitzgerald, and maybe I'll pick up Miami D off waivers, too. Say what now? Henry, you know, we've talked about how obsessing over fantasy football can't simply replace obsessing over food. OK, my bad. That motherfucker is not our hero. Look at that pretty therapist over there, calming his anorexic fantasy football loving ass down. Push in on her for a sec. Okay. I said push in, man. Come on. Triggers it. Oh yeah. Now I'm seeing it. That's a hero right there. An amazing smile, silky smooth hair. Let me look at you, girl. Woo! That's what I'm talking about. Now we in business, ladies and gentlemen. We got ourselves a hero. And I wonder. Now, like any great hero, our hero wasn't perfect. She smoked, first of all, which they normally don't let you show in movies anymore, even though we all still smoke sometimes. You know you smoke sometimes. You and the wife have a date night, you each have two martinis, you guys are feeling wild, so you buy a pack of smokes on the way home, and you each smoke one in the 7-Eleven parking lot. Then she makes you throw out the pack, but instead of throwing it out, you hide it in a plant. And some nights, you sneak out and have one. But she smells that shit on you like she's a nicotine detective. She smells that shit on you like she's Mariska Hargitay on Law and Order SVU. Mark hey. Hellenberg on CSI. S. Big S. fan. Ferguson on Law and Order. Angie Harmon on Reserve. What the fuck? Oh, my God. Holy shit! Holy shit! She just got straight up run over by a bus! Ma'am? She's gonna be okay, everybody. Probably a little banged up, but she's gonna be fine. She's a hero. She's gonna be fucked! Ma'am? Ma'am, can you hear me? Just don't know what to do. I'd give it Fuck it. To I'm out. Be with you. Will Dempsey was 35 years old when he gave up on his Sam Jackson unreliable narrator screenplay. Mm -hmm. Will was not well. Thank you. But you don't need me to tell you that. Top of the morning to you, good sir. Oh, boy. <laughs> what can I get for you? Double espresso, large cup. You got it. And what's your name? Will. Is that Will with one L or two L's? It's two L's. W I L L. Light in this place. 
is so bad. Fuck you so much. Making me sick in the head. And all the laughter is just making me sad. Stars have turned cherry red. Well. Yep. Dobo's Presto Large Cup. Oh, delicious. Thank you. Just gonna do a long pour here. Double. Thank you. You want one? No, thanks. It's Xanax. Still no. Boo humbug. It's actually Ba humbug. That's what she said. I got nowhere left to turn. I got nothing left to burn. Dylan, standing in the doorway. Third track out of time out of mind. It's his comeback album. The whole thing's like a giant fucking Keats poem. Oh, sir. It's, you're gonna love it. Just sir. give it a chance. You're gonna make me leave? I am. Bah humbug. I'm strumming sir. on my gay okay. guitar. Okay. Strum outside. Here we go. Smoke it a cheap, okay. a cigar. Here we go. Thank you very much. Under the midnight oh, okay. moon. Sir. You gotta give it a chance. No. Give no. it a chance. It's gonna no. grow on you. You're gonna love it. Will hadn't always been not well. It had really only been since his wife had left him. You know what? We'll get to that. Right now, let's just enjoy them as they were. Give it a chance. It'll grow on you. He sounds, he sounds like he's suffering. Yes, he is ah! suffering. He's suffering. Oh, like a throat infection. Every great artist is suffering. I think it's sinusitis. No one rocks a sinus infection. <laughs> 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 I'll give just, him that. Just, just, ah, like, just give him a chance. Well, he ain't the only one suffering. Come here, fuck this. Uh -oh. Hey, little buddy. Hey, little buddy. What? Oh. You feeling left out? Hey, Buckface gets it. Come here, Buckface. Will loved his wife, Abby, with an intensity usually reserved for stalkers. She was everything a man could ask for in a wife. She was nurturing, and she was beautiful, and she ate any kind of sushi the chef served to her, even the uni. Yes. Will was sure of it. Abby Dempsey was absolutely perfect. At least back then she was. <laughs> Listen to this for 30 seconds and then try and tell me Bob Dylan's not a poet. Okay. See? Let's Just, listen to who this no, 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 Just 30 seconds. To Mars? <laughs> okay, let's put that in. 30 seconds. <laughs> Dude, we've been listening to him gargle because for like a month. I know, because I'm in a phase. I can't hear this like Chewbacca noise anymore. <laughs> Just want you to just lean into it with me, okay? Will you please? And this is an important album. I mean, this is the comeback album. They thought he was done. Everybody just wrote him off. They said, you don't come back from the crazy he had, and then boom, 97, time out of mind. He won three Grammys, including album of the year. He beat Radiohead and Paul McCartney. It was just intense, unexpected genius, just hard and dark and and, I mean, he said, I'm Bob Dylan, you're not, eat a dick. He told everybody to eat a dick? Metaphorically, he told everyone to eat a dick. So just, listen, like, okay. Okay, okay, shh, just listen to this. Listen to this, the man's a genius. He's pulling from the poetry of Keats. He's getting with, shh. Stop it. Stop, shh, shh, stop, stop. This is important to me. Okay? Thank you. Come here, my face. Appreciate this with me. It's too hard to sleep. The time is running away. Feel like my soul has Stop. Stop. He sounds like he has a huge cock lodged in his throat. You are an asshole. Oh. You are an asshole. No. No, no. No, no. Oh. no. Oh. 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 Fuck face, fuck face, fuck face. <laughs> We're crushing him. Careful, oh. careful, careful. I'm sorry, careful. fuck face. No. He's okay. Hey, we have to get up. I have to take a shower, and we have to go to your parents. You said that we're gonna be late. You said that we could listen to Smash Mouth that. No, we did not. Yes, you did. Hey. Are you pregnant? 
What's going on here? With the heat rising in my eyes Every day your memory goes dimmer It doesn't haunt me like it did before I've been walking through the mirror of nowhere Trying to get to him before they close the door You ever gonna ask me out, Will? I'm just waiting for the right moment. That's good to know. All right. I'll see you around. Abby, I'm waiting for the right moment, because when I ask you out, there's not gonna be any turning back for me. I'm not gonna date anybody else for the rest of my life. I'm not gonna love anybody else for the rest of my life. I'm not gonna really care about anything else for the rest of my life. I'm waiting for the right moment, Abby, because when I ask you out, it's gonna be the most important moment of my life. And I just wanna make sure that I get it right. Say something? Yes, I said, how are you doing? Uh, you know, same. Okay. I tried masturbating the other day. I tried thinking of Abby, but I couldn't really get it done. So then I, um, I tried thinking of you, but, you know, you jerk off to your therapist, you should be institutionalized. You were institutionalized. Touche. She left six months ago today. That's right. And you've been in a facility for almost half that time, and now I, I can't help but wonder Will, are you listening to me? Okay. So I'm just wondering how you're doing, being back in the world again. Uh, you know, same. I did the writing exercise you asked me to do. Really? I'm surprised you've been so resistant to writing down your feelings. Oh, no, I didn't do that. I wrote a movie instead. I did like, uh, like, well, like five pages of a movie. It was very bad. Abby and I always talked about writing a screenplay together, like a husband and wife Tarantino, you know? You wouldn't have liked it, my screenplay. You were in it, kind of. Abby wasn't, which, you know, I know was the whole point. I met this guy when I was institutionalized. This really sweet guy. Horrible life. All I could talk about without crying was fantasy football. So he talked about it a lot. I like that guy's great face. The movie star face, you know? Oh, poor motherfucker. was the only guy there that seemed worse off than I was. We'd have dinner every night together, and then one night he didn't show up, which sucked for him because it was pizza night. Turned out he'd... How'd that make you feel? 
happy for him. Or at least relieved. I mean, you know, he was pretty miserable. And I'm no doctor, but I don't think he's ever going to feel any better. Okay, well, that brings me back to my initial question. How are you feeling? Well, you know, same. You keep saying that. I keep meaning it. Have you spoken to her? Well, since you've been out? Abby, please, could you come back to me? I'm sorry. This sucks, man. This fucking sucks. I'm go. Sorry, I'm please. Go. No. Have you been to your parents, like we discussed? I don't want to. Well, part of the reason that you were discharged and put into... I don't want to! Sorry, that was weird. Yesterday you said that you'd been feeling aimless. Well, I usually have pretty good aim, so... Thanks, friend. I ain't your friend, Peluca. This is for you, Peggy Sue. Oh, my. Thanks, daddy -o. We'll name him Fuckface. <laughs> sit, Fuckface, sit. Good dog. Mark. Marry me. Seriously. Let's get married. <laughs> We've been dating less than a year. Yeah. I know. And I feel like I've shown incredible restraint waiting this long. Say yes. You want to say yes? I don't. You want to say yes so bad it hurts? You're cocky. I'm right. Say yes. Say yes. I swear to God, if you don't say yes, I will I... shoot this Nimrod on general principle. <laughs> Stop it. Stop. I will no. say yes, I'll marry you. Stop! Sorry, that was weird. I love you. You're the love of my life, I'm sure of it. But sometimes it scares me how much you feel. You know, it's not something I ever thought I would be scared of, but... I may not be equipped to be loved this much. I'll find another way. No. I'll find another way. Hey, I will. I will love you however you're best equipped to handle it, Abby. I will love you on odd days of the week. <laughs> Baby, I will spend the rest of my life making your life better, not worse. I want to dance. I want to win. I want that trophy. I want a jib. Come on. We'd have to get a dog. Okay. I mean, I want kids too, but not yet. Okay. Dog first, small dog. Yeah. My parents died young. It makes me sad sometimes. I know. 
You'd probably make me a terrible mother. I disagree, but okay. Mainly my big thing is the dog. Small dog. I'm totally on board with the dog idea. Okay, I'll marry you. Okay. Okay. You want to meet my parents? <laughs> sure. Cool. She is, Mom. She's really gassy. Well, that means it's going to be a boy. Really? Yeah, I practically needed a hazmat suit when your mother was pregnant. Stop with that! <laughs> it's true. Sparks mean it's a boy. That almost makes them worth there. it. <laughs> Linda, I'm afraid to ask, but did you Me make Me love this oh, coming out of the oven right yeah. now. Yeah! I have never craved anything like this in my life. Lead me to that meatloaf and you I hate fucking meatloaf. Hester and backhanded compliment me all day I'm long. just grateful she didn't burn down the fucking kitchen. What'd you do to get the foot unstuck from the You just push. I'm not a big fan of like when the face goes like this. Dog dishes. Against the outside of the belly, and you're just like an alien. Know, it's a face. It's like an alien. You face. actually see the face? I'm pretty sure it's a face. No, I don't. That's creepy. Is it possible that it's clawing? This out? is, mom. <laughs> you're aware that the baby's not gonna actually live with you guys, right? I got a little carried away. This one's very so cute. Made. Hey. Isn't that cute? Yes. You better eat some of this before she gets yeah. it all. Okay. Baby clothes, baby jumpers. Tell me something. What the hell's a baby jumper for anyway? <laughs> Why does a baby need to jump? I know, as I spent all day breaking down the goddamn Amazon boxes. Oh, shush you. Here, honey, a little bit more. Come on. Brother. He's good. He's good. Oh, There's two. Oh, There's two of me. <laughs> oh, picky lady. Yeah. I can't believe I'm going to be a grandma. I still can't believe it. All right, still settle down. Abby, don't take this the wrong way. Oh, here it comes. Yep. But selfishly speaking, I'm just so glad your parents are dead. <laughs> And boom. Oh, stop it. Abby knows what I mean. Really? Yeah, she does? You do? Come on, explain. What I mean is, all I ever wanted was for Will to marry a woman with dead parents so I wouldn't have to share the grandchildren. And, and he did. I mean, my prayer came true. Jesus Christ, Mom. It's OK. She knows what I mean. <laughs> hey, Abby, by the way, mm. did you get a look at that book I sent you yet? No. It's really good. It's about preschool and anxiety separation. Oh, good. Anxiety. That feels like a first priority thing. <laughs> Freud. Because when you... <laughs> sorry, I won't, I won't admit. I, I admit. I'm sorry. Just talk about our dead parents again, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's about separation anxiety. Yeah. You know, when you drop them off at preschool for the first day, mm. and they, they go nuts, and they go limp. You know how they go limp? <laughs> Live your own life. Shush. Write your own fucking book. When oh, you drop oh, the kid please. off at preschool, right. if they get hysterical and inconsolable, both Abby's parents died in a car accident when she was a little girl. Abby was in the car, she was seven. Okay. Okay seems kind of like a strange response to that new information. Well, I was caught a little off guard. You don't talk about Abby a lot. You don't ask about her a lot? Well, I ask about her constantly. Tomato, potato. Tomato, tomato. Let's just call the whole thing off. Well, the sessions are mandated, so. No, I, the what, song. I, I'm not following. Oh my God, this is some kind of rhythm we have, huh, Doc? Maybe this is why I can't jerk off to you. Sorry, that was very inappropriate. I was institutionalized. Why don't you just tell me about Abby? What, what was she like? I'd like to hear about her. You want me to tell you about Abby? Well, then you've come to the right place, Doc, because I am the foremost expert on all things Abby. Or, I was. No, I still am. I mean, it's not like somebody else has learned more about her in the last six months. Or I guess somebody could have. I mean, I've been locked away, and Lord knows what she's been up to, wherever she is. Well? Right, you want to know about Abby. Let me tell you about Abby. <laughs> Abby Lesher was born June 30th, 1985. 
Legend has it that when she was born, she didn't make a single peep. For five minutes, little Abby just laid there, taking in the world around her, not so much as a single cry. In the years to come, her parents would always say, there wasn't anything wrong with little Abby. She just didn't have anything to say yet. Now, keep in mind, I'm getting all this secondhand. I've never met any of the people here except for Abby. Her parents die pretty soon, long before I come into the picture. No, I know. Well, it's not like I know the doctor or the nurse is here. Why would I? Please continue, Will. OK. By all accounts, Abby's childhood was a happy one. Family, I gathered you here today because I, I need to talk about something very serious, so no laughing. Uh, as you may have noticed, I have developed a bit of a drinking problem. Her parents, Jack and Elizabeth, were kind-hearted and open-hearted and all the other kinds of hearted. They were literally both elementary school teachers. That's actually how they, how they met. Mind if I sit? If Abby's mother knew that she would meet her future husband in exactly that moment, you think she would have taken such a big old bite of that peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, <laughs> Do you like some water? <laughs> wow, you feel half the sandwich in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so strange to think about. How a completely random moment involving peanut butter, a moment that happened way before I was born, would shape my entire life. Are you glad it happened? Ah, well, Dr. Morris, that is the big question, isn't it? Because if it hadn't happened, Abby's parents would never have met. They'd never have married. They'd never have honeymooned in Aruba, where they conceived Abby. They'd never have seen her come into the world without a peep. They'd never have watched her blonde hair turn brown as she got older. They'd never have watched her become obsessed with dancing and then soccer and then horses and, of course, Christmas, always Christmas. The lights, the gifts, and above all, the Rockettes. So obsessed with the Rockettes was Abby that every year, every single year, her parents would have to drive her into town to watch the Rockettes perform. Every single year except that one year Abby's parents died instantly. Abby was trapped in the backseat of the car with them for over an hour before they got her out. Her father... Her father was decapitated by the steering column. I know, right? That's the detail that always gets everybody. I mean, the story in and of itself is tragic, of course, but... When you give someone that image, that singular image of a seven-year-old girl trapped in the backseat of a car with her decapitated father, well, then it really just lands, doesn't it? Anywho, you wanted to know about Abby, so I'll continue, but be forewarned, her next decade isn't so great. Abby's parents didn't plan on dying together, so there was no will and there was no plan for Abby. And seeing as all her grandparents were deceased, Abby's uncle Joe got custody. Now, Uncle Joe wasn't a nice man. And when I say he wasn't a nice man, I don't mean like he didn't hug her. I mean, he bought her a puppy and then he killed it when it chewed up his couch. I mean, he sporadically molested her for the better part of six years until at 15 years old, Abby borrowed a gun from some wannabe gangbanger from her high school. She pointed it at Uncle Joe's head and said in no uncertain terms, I'll fucking kill you if you ever touch me again. And then she shot him in the knee. So he knew she wasn't playing. <laughs> It's like a movie, right? I always pictured a young Natalie Portman playing her. I don't know who that is. You don't know who Natalie Portman is? No. Doc, you gotta get out more. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'll tell you what, one of these nights, we'll do like a marathon of early Portman. Beautiful girls, the professional, you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? Okay. Right. Okay, well, uh, well, things got better from there. Obviously, damage had been done. Decapitated father, molesting uncle, you know, just like 
bounce back from that shit, but Abby was smart, determined, a dreamer, a reader. She hunkered down. She got herself into college, started seeing a therapist on campus who truly changed her life. She even made a very close friend. Could you please stop? I'm so sorry. Oh my God, Doc, look, oh my God, look. <laughs> look at me, this is what I look like at college. I have 491 more pages. Oh my God, look how young I look. No, no, I think you look very much the same. Oh, well, I think I look like a completely different person. Yeah, tomato, tomato. Doc, look at us. Maybe we have a chance after all. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Abby really came into her own in college. My aim. <laughs> she engaged in the outside world. She became extremely popular. She even <laughs> fell in love. Not to toot my own horn, but toot toot. She graduated top of her class with an English lit degree. Yeah. She wrote her thesis on the, the unreliable, unreliable narrator. narrator. The unreliable narrator. What's that? My thesis. Hey guys, so, unreliable narrators are considered a, a device, right? Don't answer. They are. They are. And they don't get a lot of literary analysis because it's a gimmick. It's a trick. I mean, Canterbury Tales gets a gets a shout out because you know it's good. But the, typically, it's used for popcorn crime novels and thriller movies like Agatha Christie, Usual Suspects, right. so on and so forth. But I'm gonna argue that every narrator, by its very definition, is unreliable because when you tell a story there's always an essential distance between the story itself and the telling of said story right so therefore every story that has ever been told has an unreliable narrator the only truly reliable narrator would be someone hypothetically telling a story that unfolds before our very eyes which is obviously impossible so what does that tell us the only truly reliable narrator is life itself but life itself is also a completely unreliable narrator because it is constantly misdirecting and misleading us and taking us on this journey where it is literally impossible to predict where it's gonna go next. And that is my thesis. Life as the ultimate unreliable narrator. What do you think? Yeah. It'll make more sense when I write it. I love you. Bye guys. I love you. You're up. I love her, Chuck. <laughs> Come on. Holy shit! Hello, you Abby! Hey, before when I invited you over to watch Natalie Portman movies, you know I was just being funny, right? Yes, I do. Okay, because I'm still married, so... At least I think I am. I mean, I haven't signed any papers or anything yet, so I don't really know how the whole thing works. Well, it's fine, okay? Take a deep breath, and you can... Tell me about your marriage now. You want me to tell you about my marriage? Yeah. So you haven't, you haven't really been listening to me then because it doesn't matter what I tell you, don't you? Don't, why can't you lean into this? Just you see that, right? It doesn't matter what I say because I could tell you every detail about our marriage. I could tell you every detail about the day that she left me, but why, why would my memory even be remotely accurate? I'm going through a phase. Yeah, but why and I'm asking you just... Maybe, maybe I'd actually been smothering her for years, smothering her with my love and my dreams and a baby that she wasn't ready for. Maybe I was just another guy that was in her life that seemed like I was gonna save it, but really I was just there to ruin it. Maybe she was really unhappy, and this dream girl that I created in my mind's eye was just like a narrative trick to get us through a life, you know? I mean, this is really some deep philosophical shit we're talking about here. Yes, it is. It is. Well, we've been seeing each other for a while now. And today you're talking about Abby a lot for the first time. 
And it's good. It's really good. So, tell me about that day. You had a nice morning with Abby. No, no, about I didn't. I did, that, that's not what I fucking said. I just said that it may not have been a nice morning. Okay. I said that it could have been a smothering, horrible morning. Okay, it could have been a smothering, horrible morning. You talked about Bob Dylan, then you went over to your parents' house for lunch, and then what happened? And she just left me. And she just left me. Will, she didn't she just, just leave me. you. Yes, she did. Have you seen Abby since you've been released, Will? Come back to me, Abby. Please come back to me. I'll do, I'll do anything. Just Will. give me another chance. Will. I'm talking to my fucking wife! But your wife wasn't there, was she? Well, you're not well yet, okay? You're mixing meds, you're, you're not yourself. Tell me about that day. We talked about Bob Dylan. Okay. We laughed. Okay. Go ahead. We almost crushed the dog. Okay. We went to my parents' house. Right. We ate meatloaf. Oh my god, my mom's crazy. She's totally <laughs> fucking nuts. We're never gonna do that again. Oh How are you feeling, my love? I ate too much. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Just a little bit. <sighs> you freaking ate the gross national meatloaf product of a small nation. I think we might have a meatloaf instead of a human baby. You're giving birth to meatloaf? Yeah, we're having meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> Cab? No. Walk it off? Yes, please. All right, let's walk it off. The baby's a girl, Will. What? I know we weren't gonna find out, but then the nurse slipped up, and now I feel shitty knowing. In about three weeks, you're gonna have a daughter. Say something. What? I know what you wanna name her. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I know you don't like his music, but... I love it. Big fan. I think it's cute. I think it's... I was smothering her. I was smothering her. That's why she left me. Well, listen. You suffered a trauma. It was horrific. You fucking help me! Horrific. Help me, please! You thought about killing yourself. You, you were in treatment for months to keep you safe. And now you're, you're constructing a story that somehow makes it bearable. Well, you have a baby, all right? Your baby lived. For whatever reason, miraculously, she's alive. Now, Will, wouldn't Abby want you to be there for that child? Now, why haven't you gone to your parents? Will, look at me. Why haven't you seen that baby? I think it would help you. Okay. That's why you're out, and that's why you're seeing me, to get you there. I, I think you're ready. Okay. I'm gonna go. 
No, hang on, Will. Will, hang on. No, I don't want you to leave yet. Let's... It's not the right story. Well, I'm not really the hero this of the story. Is, uh, trauma so, is vicious. I'm sorry, Will. you're very nice. You're very nice. I don't want to be here anymore. Look, just sit down. We can... Let, let me All talk right. you through this. To say Dylan Dempsey's childhood was marked by death and tragedy would be the grossest of understatements, and also a little bit douchey. She was literally born of death and tragedy. <coughs> Six months into her little life, her father started locking in the pattern. And that was just the start. Dylan lost her grandma when she was six. her best friend when she was seven. The winds of change are blowing wild and free. You ain't seen nothing like me yet. Tell them my face. How you feeling, kiddo? I feel like my whole life is going to be marked by death and tragedy. She did not say this, of course, but if she could verbalize what she was feeling at eight years old, she would have. I crave a happy life, Grandpa. I have an almost desperate craving for stability and happiness, the way fat people crave chocolate or lost hikers crave rescue. I want to live a big, great, fantastical life. But I'm concerned that the tragedy that seems to follow me, the tragedy that birthed me, will prevent that from ever happening. And I don't know if I can withstand another body blow like this. But what she really said was... How are you feeling, kiddo? Are you going to die, Grandpa? Yes. I am. Probably sooner than you'd like, kiddo. If I'm being honest. I'm gonna fight like hell to stick around for you as long as possible. To prevent one more death from coming anywhere near your doorstep. I'm gonna get on the fucking treadmill. Cut back on the red meat. I'm gonna do my best. Get you through your teenage years without losing one more goddamn thing. I'll do it for your mother and father. I'm gonna do it for your grandmother. Most of all, I'm gonna do it for your granddaughter. I'm gonna squeeze out 10 more years from this decrepit old body for you, my girl. My angel. Again, Irwin expressed this all with. No, no more dying around here, kiddo. Okay. okay. The Dylan Dempsey transformation years. The years brought puberty. Puberty brought sexuality. Sexuality brought anger and fear and confusion. And when the smoke cleared, where that sweet little girl once stood, 
there remained only a woman who scared the absolute shit out of everyone. You took a part of me that I really miss. I keep asking myself how long it can go on like this. You told yourself a lie. That's all right, mama, I told myself I'm true. Hey. Hey, I'm going out. With who? Just with some friends. Cigarettes. Grandma used to say it's a nasty habit of people lighting little fires under their noses. Cool. You aren't even going to try and hide them from me? Aren't we both better than that? I don't know. You hear Vermont's made him illegal. Remind me never to go to Vermont. I have one. No. Just one. None of these things will kill you. I was hoping we could talk about college. We talked about it last night. I didn't get very far. Yes, we did. We just didn't get where you wanted it to go. I'm 21, Erwin. Give up on the dream. I've almost saved enough to get out of your hair. I promise. Promise you'll be home by 11? I'd rather not lie to you. Please lie to me. I'll be home by 11. Dylan. Happy 21st, kiddo. Some sugar. Mwah. Peace. Hey, <clears throat> hey everyone, we're PB and J. Um, uh, this first song is kind of personal. Um, <clears throat> my mom died 21 years ago today and- Take it off! <laughs> they tell me she used to listen to Bob Dylan. Bob! When the rain is blowing in your face And the whole world is on your case I can offer you a warm embrace To make you feel my love When the evening shadows and the stars appear Thank you. 
Hey! What the fuck? Hey! Hey, you owe me a new phone, bitch. Yeah. You're right, I'm sorry. That I, I shouldn't have done that. I, this has just been a really weird day for me. Um, let me see what I have on me. Can you hold that a second? I'm so, so sorry. Find out, but then the nurse slipped up, and now I feel shitty knowing. In about three weeks, you're gonna have a daughter. Actually, Daddy's gonna blow his brains out before he even meets me. So, say something. I know what you want to name her. I know you don't like his music. I want to look to your right, lady. I love it. Big fan. Mom, I think it's pretty cute. I think it's gonna be. Mom, mom, mom. If Rodrigo Gonzalez had really been there that night, he might have told the stone young woman sitting in front of him that it mattered quite a bit to him that Dylan Dempsey was okay. Buenos días, señores. ¿Cómo andamos? <laughs> bueno, bueno, bueno. Hombre, Salvador, ¿cómo andamos? ¿Bien? Bien, bien. Qué alegría, Qué alegría para todos. Muy bien, muy bien. Buen año, buen año. Pues me alegro, me alegro mucho. Ah, un poquito cansado. Acércate, estoy contigo en un segundo. Siéntate.
Siente. Javier, me he dado cuenta de que tú y yo no hemos hablado nunca. Hace cinco años que yo soy dueño de estas tierras y no me recuerdo que nos hayamos dicho más que unas pocas palabras. ¿Quieres beber algo? No, señor. No, bueno. Yo crecí en Italia, eso lo sabías, ¿no? Que soy medio italiano. Parezco como tú, sueno como tú. Eh, pero me llamo Sachone y he vivido la mayor parte de mi vida en Italia. Mi padre, italiano, vino a Andalucía cuando era joven y aquí conoció a mi madre. ¿Sabías esta cosa? ¿Sabías que mi madre era de esta región? No, señor. Mi padre era un auténtico hijo de la gran puta. Eh, conoció a mi madre cuando ella era muy joven, la conquistó, la alejó de todo lo que conocía, de todos a los que quería, y bueno, él era posesivo, controlador, agresivo, y, y encima era rico, lo que convierte a un auténtico hijo de la gran puta como él en alguien particularmente periculoso. Periculoso. Oye... ¿Estás seguro de que no quieres tomar nada? ¿Una jerez? ¿Una manzanilla? Yo me voy a poner una manzanilla. Bueno, está, está bien. bien. Una manzanilla está bien. Claro que sí, hombre. Pues ahí estaba mi madre. Una jovencita española. Andaluza, de pura cepa. Arrancada de su familia. Viviendo en medio de la campiña italiana y para remate, sin hablar ni una sola palabra de italiano. Toma. No. Sí, sí. Salud. Salud. Mi padre... Decide entonces que quiere una, una esposa italiana y una familia italiana. Así que prohíbe hablar español en su casa. Corta el contacto con la familia de ella y deja a mi madre sin lo que ella más quería. Sin nadie a quien amar. Entonces se queda embarazada. Embarazada de mí. Así que durante esos años, eh, cada vez que mi padre viaja por trabajo, ella en secreto pide que le manden paquetes desde su patria. Comida española, vino... Sí. Nuestro premio favorito, el aceite de oliva español. ¿Puedes creértelo? Estábamos ahí, en el campo italiano, la cuna del aceite de oliva más famoso del mundo, y nosotros, tomando aceite de oliva español con la misma pasión con la que tú y yo nos bebemos ahora esta manzanilla. <ríe> menuda, menudo dos, mi madre y yo. Vaya dos. Mi madre murió cuando yo solo tenía 16 años. Tan pronto como falleció, el cabrón de mi padre me rechazó. Él veía a mi madre en mí. Para él ella era una española sucia que le había arruinado la vida. Pero por suerte... Eh, <ríe> mi padre no era solo un cretino intolerante. También era un narcisista. Nunca pensó que fuera a morirse, ni siquiera cuando se fue haciendo mayor o cuando se puso enfermo. Así que nunca hizo testamento. Ay, ay, ay. Cuando por fin dejó este mundo, 
yo me convertí en un hombre extremadamente rico, Javier. Y la primera cosa que hice fue comprar estas tierras en Andalucía, donde ahora cultivo cientos de acres del mismo aceite de oliva que mi mamá y yo disfrutábamos. Y aunque mis otras obligaciones me tienen de viaje la mayor parte del tiempo, esta tierra es lo único que me importa. Esta tierra es mi historia y es la historia de mi madre. Y es por esto que la aceituna significa tanto para mí. Y ahora debo preguntarte, ¿por qué significa tanto para ti? No le sigo, señor. Los otros hombres usan eh, varas y, y mallas, pero tú las coges a mano. Lo que solo te permite es recoger la mitad. Bueno, por eso trabajo el doble, señor. No, 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 no lo sé, lo sé. No, no es una crítica, es una simple pregunta. ¿Por qué trabajas más duro que el resto de los hombres? Porque creo que es la manera correcta de hacerlo, señor. <risa> te, cu te cuento mi historia. Te cuento la historia del hijo de la gran puta de mi padre, de mi pobre madre maltratada. Y cuando te pido que hagas lo mismo, lo único que me dices es que... Es porque es la manera correcta. Vamos, hombre, bébete la manzanilla y cuéntame tu historia. Yo soy un hombre sencillo, señor. No tengo ninguna historia. Mi padre no era un hijo de la gran puta. Mi padre era un hombre divertido, que silbaba mientras trabajaba. Y yo estoy feliz de poder hacer un trabajo en el cual puedo silbar mientras lo hago. La vara y el rastrillo me agullan la aceituna. Por eso yo la cojo con las manos. Es la manera correcta, eso es todo, señor. Los trabajadores te quieren mucho. Te he visto contarles historias y hacerles reír. Y... Soy un bocazas. <risa> Pero conmigo es muy reservado. Porque usted es el jefe, señor. Eso quiero ser tu amigo. No. Le decepcionaría como amigo. No, no creo. No creo. Ya le he dado una respuesta, señor. curioso. El resto de los hombres me aprecian y apenas me conocen. Tú acabas de escuchar mi historia y ni te has inmutado. ¿No te hace sentir aprecio por mí? No pasa nada. Puedes decirme lo que quieras y ser totalmente honesto. No me hace apreciarlo más, señor. ¿Puedo preguntarte por qué? Yo no habría cogido el dinero. ¿Mm? Bueno, eh, ¿te gustaría vivir aquí? ¿Encargarte de supervisar al resto de los hombres como capataz? Gratis. Sí, gratis. <ríe> Además, tendrías un aumento de sueldo. No. Y con la vivienda sería más que suficiente. Pero tengo una condición. Cuidaré sus tierras. Le ayudaré a que prosperen como si fueran mías. Pero mi silbido es para mí. Y mi bocaza es para los jornaleros. No me pida nada, señor. 
Y a cambio yo nunca le pediré nada a usted. At exactly this moment, a mere 4,000 miles away, Abby Dempsey, then Abby Lesher, had just finished the first draft of her college thesis. But life itself proves to be the most unreliable of narrators, forever taking us on a journey where it is impossible to predict what might happen next. Life, it's, okay, this next part gets a little Read, flower. woman. I know, but I feel like it's getting away from literary Read. Ugh, okay, fine. Life itself tricks us. It misleads us. It paints one man a hero when he may well be a villain. Hero or villain? Villain or hero? Or maybe neither. Maybe life is playing the role of unreliable trickster yet again. Maybe those it paints as the heroes and villains of our stories are actually just day players in a much bigger movie. Maybe they're simply extras filling the frame so the real heroes can have bodies crossing in the background. And then it sort of says that over and over again. You <clears throat> are so much smarter than me. I really am, aren't I? Abby's thesis was a total disaster. Her favorite and most trusted professor argued, as she feared he might, that she had strayed from literary criticism and had veered into an unwieldy cross of creative writing in 17th century French philosophy. Then Abby's favorite and most trusted professor tried to fuck her, which one might argue proved Abby's thesis after all. A continent away, Javier Gonzalez was worried about none of this. Javier Gonzalez didn't philosophize, and he never wondered what life had in store for him. Javier Gonzalez knew where he was going. He'd known all along. <laughs> Isabel Diaz had been taught from birth to expect a very average life. She was one of six sisters and was openly considered to be the fourth prettiest. No te rías. Me gustaría hacerlo oficial. Que sí, que... Pero no llores, ¿vale? No, 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 no lloro. Nuestro. ¿Qué te parece? Ah, me siento como un terrateniente. Es nuestro. Esto es nuestro. en la Apareció como un secreto. Escondido en la actitud. 
poco a poco fue bajando el murmullo de de venir hasta los pies de la montaña donde el pueblo bebe y se baña la, 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 Aquí es donde estamos, Andalucía. Pues, y si cruzas por aquí, si... ¡Pum! nos encontramos aquí con este trozo de tierra, así como marroncillo verdoso que se llama América. ¿Nueva York? Nueva York, ¿te acuerdas? <ríe> ¿Se acuerda de las historias de Nueva York que le conté hace Isabel rato? could no longer remember when Mr. Sassion first started coming over to visit Rodrigo. She only knew that the visits had become more consistent, usually in the middle of the day, always when Javier was in the fields. Le pido disculpas. No, he alargado demasiado mi visita. No, 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 para nada. Sí, sí. No, no, no. Sí, sí, lo he hecho. Lo he hecho. Tengo muchas cosas increíbles en mi vida, señora González. Pero... Mi educación tan poco común... Uh, me ha dejado con algunas cicatrices que no me han permitido encontrar la más importante de todas las cosas. Y no es justo que ahora trate de llenar ese vacío aquí. No sea tonto, para nada. Además, Rigo le adora. Bueno, es muy amable por su parte. No, de verdad. Sí, realmente es un crío muy especial. Es muy inteligente, ¿verdad? Bien, me encantaría enseñarle inglés y literatura. Y... Sería genial eso. Sí. Sería genial. Amor, hola. Javier, perfecto porque venía a hablarte de, del tema de la ampliación del molino. Y de paso, pues le he traído un regalo a vuestro hijo. No hacía falta, señor. Es demasiado generoso por su parte. Un detalle. Además, Rigo ya tiene un montón de cosas aquí. ¿Sí? ¿Mm? La próxima vez que necesite hablar conmigo, hágamelo saber y yo iré a buscarle. Más si se ahorra el paseo. ¡No! Muchas gracias. ¿Quiere que hablemos ahora del molino? ¿Mm? Seguro. Javier González was a simple man, but not a stupid one. And that day he began doing something he'd never done before, planning a family vacation to a place that he had just learned his son desperately wanted to visit, but someone else. Sombras <laughs> delatan el no querer seguir mi tiempo se acaba y ya no puedo dormir. Siento en el alma un paso mortal. Quiero ir adelante. No, adelante no, digo que es peligroso. ¿Quieres que vayamos adelante? No. Sí. Yo lo tengo y nos vamos adelante. Hola. 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 Somos de España, españoles. ¿De qué parte? Eh, ya es de Hola. Madrid, yo soy del sur de Madrid. Ay, qué bueno. Hey, hey. Rodrigo, no molestes al señor con que está conduciendo. Detrás de todo lo a pregnant woman eviscerated by a bus. A grown man weeping desperately. 
bystanders screaming. It was only about 20 seconds of footage, but it would replay on a loop in little Rodrigo Gonzalez's brain for years to come. Está despierto. Tú escuchas que está despierto, ¿no? Quiero decir, no soy el único que está escuchando que está despierto. No. ¿Qué no ves que si le gritas no se muere la cama? Le duermes tú. Venga. ¿Qué no ves que le duermes tú? Le duermes tú. Rigo, para. Rigo. ¿Me vas a obligar a comer? Un no poco. tengo hambre. No Un tengo poco, hambre. Vela, coño. Esos a los que van los ricos. Nosotros no somos ricos, Mila. Es nuestro hijo. Es nuestro pequeñajo y está sufriendo. De acuerdo. No. Porque me dijo que habías estado un poco triste. Uh -huh. Y bueno, para mí el diagnóstico es claro. Después de estas dos sesiones, eh, Rodrigo tiene un trauma infantil, como ya lo sabéis, uh -huh. que viene dado por ese suceso angustiante que vivió en el accidente. Uh -huh. Rodrigo está respondiendo muy bien a todas mis sugerencias para que se exprese a través de los dibujos y de los juegos, y eso es muy importante. Va a llevar tiempo Va a llevar tiempo, pero la buena noticia es que esto es tratable y es curable. Eso es muy importante que lo sepas. Por eso, a nivel económico... Mmm, no, no Isabel, Isabel, Isabel. No se bueno, yo creo que hay que eso. saberlo. No, pero... Months passed. Mr. Sassion's visits were no longer restricted. His gifts no longer withheld. Wow. <laughs> And now, in English. My name is... Rodrigo González. Muy bien. Bien escrito. But I like to be called Rado. Or Rigo? Yeah. Oh. I am from Spain. Keep going. I was sad yeah, for really. a long time. But my uncle got me a bird, which helps.
¿La amas? Sí. ¿Y a Rodrigo? Sí. Lo siento, Javier. Supongo que la soledad vuelve a los hombres débiles. No estoy orgulloso de ello. Seguro que su padre sí que estaría orgulloso. Se puede decir que es usted un digno hijo de su padre, señor. Javier, tienes mi palabra de que me mantendré lejos de ellos. Tu hijo se está curando y ya no me necesitan. Ellos son tu familia, Javier, no la mía. No. Visto cómo le miras y cómo te miran a ti. Madre mía, estás borracho. Estás borracho y celoso. También he visto lo que ha hecho por Rodrigo. Sí, le ha ido a curarse. O sea, algo que yo no podía haber hecho nunca. Por eso le pedimos ayuda a él. Y cuando él nos dio ayuda, tú desapareciste, ¿sí o no? No sé, que buscabas la solución en las botellas. Tengo un trabajo en Madrid, de mecánico. Pagan bien. ¿Qué? ¿Qué dices? Pues iré mandando el dinero, pero no creo que os haga mucha falta a partir de ahora, ¿no? No me digas lo que me merezco, Javi. No te atrevas ni un solo minuto a decirme lo que me merezco, que yo sé lo que me merezco. ¿Tú te crees que me estás haciendo un favor de algo? ¿Te crees que me salvaste de algo? ¿Que me encontraste de una vida de mierda y me sacaste de esa vida? ¿Tú te crees eso? Yo te escogí a ti. Yo te escogí a ti. Javier. Hola. Yo te escogí porque sabía lo que me merecía y sabía que me merecía alguien especial. Hola. Alguien bueno que me mirara con esos ojos. Mírame los ojos. Mírame estos ojos que se ríen de todo y dime que conmigo tendrías una vida mejor que con él. Contigo tendría una vida mejor que con él. Rodrigo es todo lo que tengo y no quiero que sufra más. No quiero que sufra ni un minuto más. Y me da exactamente igual lo que haga con su vida. Solo quiero que encuentre su camino, que sea feliz. Tú me vas a ayudar aunque lo encuentre. Dilo. Voy a ayudar a Rodrigo a encontrar su camino.
Nunca voy a quererte como le quiero a él. No sé. If we've learned anything by now, it's not to get attached to new heroes. They tend to disappoint. But damn if little Rodrigo Gonzalez didn't look like the real deal. Incluso en este justo momento en que nada ocurre, calma blanca, ropa de cama de hotel. Olores de vida plena. Sexo ligero, agua fresca, zumo de fruta y café. Incluso ahora que ya no hay miedo, que nada tiembla, sal de baño, brillo dorado en la piel. Un beso sin... ¡Mamá! Que me han cogido en la Universidad de Nueva York, que estoy dentro. Que estoy dentro. ¿Qué te pasa? Está enferma, Rodrigo. Iré más adelante. Con todo lo que está pasando. ¿eh? He dicho que eso no lo decides tú. Ella me lo ha dado todo siempre, me ha dado su vida entera. No pasa nada porque ella ha hecho por ella. Rodrigo. He dicho que voy a hacerlo. Y a ver cómo salimos de esto. Lo resolveremos del mismo modo que vosotros hicisteis conmigo. Mírame. Tenemos que hacer esto por ella. Rodrigo. Tu madre pregunta por ti. ¿Vale? Rodrigo, ya ha pasado mucho tiempo y no mejoró. Y tu tío se gasta un dineral en probar cosas para ver si... Pero, Rigo... Y tú de mientras esperas. Mi amor... Ya basta. Mamá... Basta. Te... Rigo, basta. Rodrigo entered college a visiting freshman, and as he'd been doing for most of the previous decade, he thrived. He lettered in two sports. His marks were at the very top of his class. He even embarked on a relationship with a 20-something from Long Island named Sherry Dickstein. She made him laugh, usually not intentionally. Oh my God, you've never been to Whole Foods? No, but what okay, is I'll that? take you there. It's like a dream. It's like a. She wasn't his great love, but she was company, and great love wasn't his priority at the moment. Clean eating, vegan dream. What's, what's vegan? 
Oh my god, you're adorable. I love that you don't know things. He saved every dollar, coveted every vacation. Rodrigo Gonzalez had an internal compass, and it always pointed in the same direction. Es de un sitio que se llama Long Island. <coughs> en Nueva York. Sí. Mira. No, oh, papá. Se llama Shari Ditchain. Shari. Shari, con ese. Shari. Shari. Shari Ditchain. Shari Ditchain. ¿Cómo es? Ella, pues. Es bastante ruidosa, la verdad. No. Sí, sí, sí. Like so many of the biggest years of our lives, it flew by. But in truth, that year was just a setup, a preamble to the biggest day of Rodrigo Gonzalez's life. Just going for a quick run. Mi arma. Huh? When we first started dating, you used to call me Mi arma. You would have said, just going for a quick run, Mi arma. It always made me feel like Kelly Ripa. <laughs> Shadi. I'm pregnant. I know. Obvi, lots to talk about. Hey. Will you take me for brunch? There's this place I really want to try. It's Vietnamese, which I'm assuming is kind of like dim sum or something. We can talk at brunch at the Vietnamese place. I really want to try it. So I just started feeling shitty a few weeks ago. I thought I was just getting a really bad period. Ever since I got off the pill, I have been having bananas periods, you know? But it wasn't stopping. So I went to my gyno and he was like, are you sexually active? So I told him about you. And then he did the test thing and blammo. I hadn't even thought to try an at-home test. For whatever reason, my brain did not go there whatsoever. Anyways, I know that we haven't been together very long and clearly this is as what the fuck as things get. I mean. I don't know what your deal is with religious stuff, but I'm thinking that I should probably just get an abortion. Are you like, are you like super against that abortion? I know abortion's a really big deal for Christians. There should like be like a pill or something for something like this, like unplanned pregnancy. Because if you're Christian, I'm Anyhow, we don't have to decide any of this right now, but I would like to make the call early just before the thing has like a head and stuff, you know? Oh, hey, there we are. <laughs> so, the way I see it, we have like three options. Option one, we have it. I mean, a mixed race baby with our skin complexions would be amazeballs. My family have that shit money so we could get nannies and stuff. I don't know, it's probably a bad idea. Option two, abort. But again, I would like to make that call sooner rather than later. Or option three, we can just both agree that this is all an insane April Fool's joke. Ah! What? April Fool's, bitch. W what is that? Seriously, you don't know April Fool's? No, I don't. Well, I didn't know that. So there is no baby? Dude, ew, no, of course not. Oh, come on. You have to admit, that was, that was pretty funny. Shari. <laughs> oh, fuck. You're gonna break up with me, aren't you? He was. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm sorry. Obviously, nothing thus far had indicated that this would be the most important day of Rodrigo's life. Now, sometimes the most important days of our lives begin and we're not even there to see it. Tengo que llamar a Rodrigo. 
Isabel. Ya nos hemos despedido. Isabel. No hace falta despedirse dos veces. Es un buen hombre. Lo eres. Hola, Vela. Mr. Sassion was a letter writer. He always had been. He believed in the power of the written word, the force of actually sitting down and writing to someone by hand. Javier, tienes mi palabra de que me mantendré lejos de ellos. Tu hijo se está curando y ya no me necesita. Ellos son tu familia, Javier, no la mía. No. No voy a volver. Por eso le tengo que pedir un favor. And with that, Mr. Sassion's letters found a new recipient. A man whose only request was that he be kept up to date on those he had abandoned, but still cherished. ¿Qué hice, tío? ¿Qué está? ¿Cómo está? Bien, una tarde movidita. Sí, con la ruidosa. When critics reviewed Abby Dempsey's favorite album, Bob Dylan's 1997 release, Time Out of Mind, 
The song Make You Feel My Love was a source of much criticism. Every track on the album brimmed with unrelenting melancholy and sadness. But there, smack in the middle of it all, sat an unabashedly populist hit song. A love song. A song that in years to come would be covered by Garth Brooks, of all people. Critics argued that putting an on-the-nose love song in the middle of an album about despair and tragedy was Dylan's only misstep. Others argued that it was his point. Are you okay? <laughs> Hola. My father, Rodrigo Gonzalez, officially met my mother, Dylan Dempsey, that day. The most important day of his life. Hi. They would not spend a single night apart for the next 42 years. They would go on to have four children, seven grandchildren. A love story for the ages. My grandmother, Abby Dempsey, argued in her failed college thesis that life itself is our most unreliable narrator. She argued that no one knows where their story is going, nor who the heroes in it are going to be. And while it's true that life has often made it difficult to pinpoint the heroes of my family's story, my parents have always made it incredibly easy for me. They found the one populist love song in our family's often very melancholy album. Unlike my grandmother, Abby, my grandmother, Isabel, was neither a writer nor a philosopher. But sometimes I wonder if she didn't understand exactly what Bob Dylan was going for. Spanish does not often translate perfectly, but what Isabel said to my father the day she sent him away it required no translation. Mama, Basta. It... Enough. Listen to me. Rico, you have had many ups and downs in your life. Too many. And you will have more. This is life. And this is what it does. Life brings you to your knees. <laughs> it brings you lower than you think you can go. But if you stand back up and move forward, if you go just a little farther, you will always find love. I found love in you. In my life, my story will continue. Because you are my story. You are your father's story, your uncle's. Rego, my body fails me, but you are me. So you go now. You stand us back up. You get up and go. Forward. 
farther. And find us to love. Will you do that? I'm not sure whose story I have been telling. I'm not sure if it is mine or if it's some characters I have yet to meet. I'm not sure of anything. All I know is that at any moment, life will surprise me. It will bring me to my knees. And when it does, I will remind myself I will remind myself that I am my father. And I am my father's father. I am my mother. And I am my mother's mother. And while it may be easy to wallow in the tragedies that shape our lives, and while it's natural to focus in those unspeakable moments that bring us to our knees. We must remind ourselves that if we get up, if we take the story a little bit farther, si vamos más allá, hay amor. If we go far enough, there's love. Hey. Hey. Goddamn.